Hey there, it's me again, Celia. I'm going to keep talking about my Lyme story. And in this video, I'm going to talk about a time when I was 25 until 31. And uh, when I was 31, I was tested for Lyme. And so this is kind of the time period before then. What stands out looking back during this time to me, um, particularly with what was happening with my body and how Lyme and the co-infections was bothering me uh, was a time of cachexia or wasting or emaciation that I had. Basically, I just lost a ton of weight even though I was eating a ton and I was constantly hungry. That really stands out. Um, I also had a huge fatigue crash. Uh, those just increased and increased every year pretty much. And um, I was absolutely drained and exhausted from trying to be a normal person and go to grad school. Totally just uh, depleted me beyond <laughs> anything I ever thought was possible. Um, but mostly when I think of this time, this is when I was highly invested into managing my constant daily pain, inflammation, you know, overall and fatigue through lifestyle, you know, um, I just did everything I could to make myself feel as good as I could. And I think that's great. And I don't think that's wrong for me, but I have a certain sense of sadness with that because all the lifestyle changes in the world could not have medicated me and what I really needed, which was just to kill some bacteria. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was just so desperate for anything to help me feel even a fraction of a percent better that I don't say I was like addicted, but I was dependent on things like diet and meditation and yoga to help me feel better. In fact, I went to school for acupuncture, you know, so that I could go get acupuncture because <laughs> it helped me. I needed that. Um, that's mostly what I think about from this period. Also, um, you know, not related to my Lyme, but my own dog died of Lyme during this time. So I'll talk about that a little bit. All right, so let's get into it. So in the last video, I left off being 24. Well, and then I quickly turned 25 at the end of the last video and I went to a wonderful four-month herbal internship uh, so I was an intern at this herbal retreat center and botanical sanctuary and it was amazing it was so relaxing so rejuvenative I lived in a cabin with another intern who I adored I was surrounded by lovely people and nourishing food. <laughs> I was just like pampered and lived in nature and it was amazing. So my job at this place was to do gardening in the herbal gardens for 20 hours a week and then help out with random things like um, classes and workshops would be held at this retreat center. And there also was a conference that was like in New Hampshire that we helped out with. So we did things like that, just kind of helping out. But then we got to go to the classes and the workshops and the conferences as guests, which was nice. And yeah, it was super, super fun. So caterers would come in and make this amazing, super healthy, incredibly beautiful, thoughtful array of food for the workshops and classes. And after everybody left, the food was still there and me and the intern got to eat it. So I was <laughs> like cooked this incredible food and just breathing fresh air and living in an off-grade cabin. It was so incredible. I sprained my ankle pretty bad at one point and I laid on a couch for a full week or almost a week, maybe six days. I just couldn't really move and, you know... I wanted it to heal right, so I had the luxury of putting my feet up for a week. <laughs> and it did help a lot with my healing, that's for sure. But when I was off my feet, what did I do? Like, read, 
drink some tea, eat some food, take a bajillion million naps. It really was incredible. So I returned home from that internship and I was so rejuvenated. Okay, so my regular energy level since I've been about 12 has been a three or if I'm doing well, a four out of 10. And in my scale, like one is can't get out of bed and 10 is everything you need. One, two, three, four, five, that half of the chart is like on the not enough end. Of course, it's more severe when you get to one. Like you could pretty much always use a nap. You don't have enough to get through. You have to rest. You just feel like, oh, I don't have enough. And then six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 is you have more than enough energy. So I was, as usual, probably about a three and sometimes a four out of 10 at this time, like before I went to the retreat center, did this internship. And when I returned, my energy was the most it had ever been since I was a kid. I would say my energy was a five or six out of 10. There were days where I did not have to rest. I had enough energy. I could do things that I wanted. I wasn't just carrying around the, the fatigue as this heavy, heavy weight on all of my body all of the time. Like I separated from that fatigue and it was, it was incredible. And it lasted for a full year. I'm so excited just thinking about this. I can't believe this happened to me. And I wish that I could go back there or not to that place but like I wish I could go on a retreat for three months you know like sometimes we need to convalesce and heal and in old olden days U.S. when we were still kind of more you know pre-Henry Ford work week and things um, people would do that they would go to a sanitarium and rest to help them feel better. People would do that. In Europe, people still do that. They'll get a prescription to go to the mountains for three months or go to the seaside. Like that is medicine. <laughs> so as I've been preparing for this video, I kept thinking like, oh, I wish I could do that again. And just before I wrote my notes out for this video right now, I was like, why don't I try to live like that? Like, why can't my life be containing those elements from that place? I even remember some of the food that we ate. Like, why don't I just cook and have all that food around and I can just keep eating on it? You know, like I need to incorporate that sort of care and prioritize nature and living simply and probably need to be not in an urban area. I don't know. I do like it here. <sighs> Anyways, it was incredible. And I do think this is related to my Lyme story because I had to rest for four months. I had to exit ordinary life to get my energy level to a five or six out of 10. And I don't think that's normal. I think normally people should have a five or six out of 10 energy level just normal American people you know ideally it would be more but we do a lot and we work a lot so I'm um, you know and then if those people went on a rest they would have much more energy so okay I had to start this story with that incredibly fairy like because it was like another world it was I just entered into this alternate reality of where I had care and rejuvenation and nourishment and simplicity it was so now I'm thinking about like 2009 2008 um what I remember from this time is that my dysmenorrhea my menstrual cramps became much more severe I went to I probably had two full days of completely debilitating eight or nine out of ten pain for that whole time and this is when I started to use a leave regularly. And the sad thing about me using a leave is that, first of all, it ripped my gut apart and it caused leaky gut and systemic inflammation and actually made my menstrual cramps worse, um, along with any uh, and all other inflammatory sort of things going on with me. Um, 
So not only was it a detriment to my own body. Now, I know other people can tolerate a leave just well. I'm not saying don't use it. Um, it is very good for menstrual cramps because it's an anti-prostaglandin type of medicine. But the other sad thing is that um, it started to not help. And so I kind of, my pain just increased. But yet I still had to take it. Uh, on my wedding day in 2009, I... My period came a week early. My totally clockwork cycle came early. And it was not because I was stressed about my wedding. Because my wedding was essentially me and my husband eloping. We bought some fancy clothes. We set a date. We invited a few of our closest family. Like, hey, do you want to come to our elopement? It, and then we went out to dinner afterwards. It was so, so basic. But actually, I was going through a really stressful time with my work really really horrible job situation that I had to get out of but I was conflicted and it made me like sick to my stomach over the amount of stress from this job so I think that's why my period came early but what I remember from my wedding day is that I had horrible horrible menstrual cramps and I was like what am I gonna do like this would usually be a day where I'm totally in bed, like laid up, crying and mowing and can't move and like totally disconnected from reality in a ball on my bed, like sobbing. Um, but I just took a whole bunch of leave and just kept taking more and more. Now, if you take three leaves within a 24 hour period, your chance for spleen cancer substantially raises. You're at risk for spleen cancer. So it's not good to take that much, but I really had no other choice. So that was kind of like a big downer from this time. Other than that, I matured in how I took care of myself and I led a, probably one of the most balanced, harmonious times in my life. Like I had a lifestyle that I loved, you know, um, I would hike almost every day. We lived really close to nature in kind of like a desolate part of town even though we were still part of a city which was cool um my work was balanced I had a day job that paid the bills and then I had an herbal business which I threw all of my energy into because I had energy the first time in my life I could do things I could give back I could contribute I could share I could make a plan and follow it through I could do the work to execute something instead of being so fatigued and so in pain all the time. That was nice. <laughs> I wish I could do that again. Uh, I also was really into like my hobbies. I was really into crafting and my friends and family and I was part of a number of like community groups and it was a really really good time. But all good things, you know, we got to evolve. <laughs> So I applied to Chinese medicine school and I got accepted. Uh, we put, I put it off for a year because we would have to sell our house. Now this was 2009. The housing crash happened in 2008. So it was like, are we even going to sell our house in a year? It was kind of scary. And would we make money off of it? Um, we ended up selling it, yes. It took maybe six months to sell it and... Uh, yes, we did make money off of it because we bought a fixer. Just putting that in there. Um, so this became a stressful period because we had to pack up our house and like clean it up and move out of our house. So we moved out of our house on June 30th. And then the month of July, we were like couch surfing, staying at friends and families and like driving all over the place where we lived in Minnesota and Wisconsin. It was like we were two hours from my hometown and three hours from Rob's hometown and then like two hours from somebody else we wanted to visit. So it was just all these long drives, you know, in the car with the dog, with our stuff. And our stuff was a point of contention because uh, we were moving or like, where are we going to put it? How are we going to do it? And my husband and I started to fight. This was the first time we were like really fighting. All of this like moving around, getting things um, ready, um, basically resulted in me having a huge fatigue 
attack. You could call it a crash. I'm not sure what. But I just got so fatigued and so achy. And I just became a huge ball of tired and wired and an extremely painful person. And in the month of August, we went to Europe for a honeymoon, which was great and fun. And it was a wonderful time. And I don't want to sound like a spoiled, complaining brat. But what I remember from our Europe trip was being so sick and so tired and just wanting to like claw out my eyeballs and be like, why do I feel this way? Because I was so tired, but I couldn't rest because I was in such pain. Okay, so still, it was wonderful things. I had great times. It definitely was good to kind of be there because I had distractions. But also if I needed to just like lay in bed at our bed and breakfast or hotel or wherever we were I could do that so I had some freedom and perhaps you have noticed this your body knows when you're on vacation it's like hey now's the time to rest okay like we're gonna make you rest you know that's why we get sick on the weekends (laughs) it's you know seems unfair but um I also understand the logic but on my case, I just couldn't get enough rest. I couldn't fill the, the empty bucket that I was. I couldn't meet the needs that my body was screaming at me that I needed because I, didn't have, I couldn't, get, couldn't get sleep. Um, part of this was because I started to engage in... Engage? I started to eat some gluten when we were in Europe. So we got to Amsterdam and I ate just like a little bit of gluten there and it was good. It was fine. I got to Belgium. It was fine. Got to France and we were in Paris. That was great. You know, it's like the wheat in France is so different from here. It's regulated as to where it comes from. It has to come from a certain province and it's like heirloom quality and it has super fresh and it contains biodiversity and is grown on soil they just have a completely different nourishing understanding than what we do here in the U.S. so it was quality and it was easy for me to digest and think about it a croissant is pretty much half butter anyways (laughs) so I'm not even getting that much gluten But as soon as we got to Germany, I had some wheat there and I totally could not handle it. The wheat there was harder. It's much more hearty. It's more of like, you know, hard rolls and more resistant to disease. And so it's just too, too hard for me to digest. And I totally flared up from that. I was just sick. I felt like I was so inflamed. I looked like the state puff marshmallow man. I know I wasn't. But that's what I felt like. I couldn't poop for four days. Yeah, I talk about that. <laughs> um, you know, I just felt horrible. Also, at this time, I realized that my right breast was totally inflamed and very painful. So I had been using this big backpack to carry my clothes, you know, backpacking, I guess. And the pressure from the backpack on my shoulder just messed up like my lymphatic ducts and I have a really old injury in the shoulder. When I was a little kid, I chronically dislocated or technically sublaxed my right shoulder. It would just pop out of the socket all the time and everybody in my family knew how to put it together. It was a very common thing. Um, But I have so much damage there and right now I have so much damage in there that like I can't use my hand so this has been an ongoing thing um and yeah it got just my whole arm and shoulder and chest wall became very inflamed and painful and the swelling that I had in my right breast felt like mastitis I had mastitis after my second kid was born and it was horrible I didn't have the infection feeling which was good because that sucks but I just felt so inflamed and like filled to the brim with like gross, toxic substances that were making me just feel horrible. I felt like hung over, basically. And on fire and totally exhausted. So yeah, that was my Europe trip right there. <laughs> 
All right. So we got back and then I started grad school. We moved to Portland and I started off being really draining situation. Um, the grad program was not academically challenging. There were totally way more challenging classes when I went to undergrad, like undergrad physics or, you know, chemistry or math was way harder than anything I did at grad school. But there was a major difference that made the Chinese medicine program that I went to very, very draining. First of all, everybody gets drained. And I think it's because of this. So at this time, I think things have changed now. The whole program has changed. They're changing the whole thing. But um, what everybody had to do was perform, essentially. You had to recite verbally and use your hands to demonstrate what you knew to the instructor or TA. And you had to do it on a regular basis, like multiple times a week. There also was a lot of memorization for the classes that weren't hands-on. Um, for instance, we learned 360 Chinese herbs in one year. So basically, you had to l learn everything about one herb every single day for a year. And that's just crazy. That's not at all how I learned Chinese Western herbalism. You could spend a year learning one plant. Um, but this was really like purge and regurge type of information. So it was super draining. But in the classes that we had to demonstrate what we knew... It was like um, you had to explain everything you knew. Um, like this is, you know, they would ask you, tell, tell me about the bicep. And you're like, the bicep inserts here and it originates here. And it's innervated by this. And it is these actions. And then you just had to do that for everything. And especially after this post-pandemic time where there is some information coming out about Zoom fatigue being real. Um, essentially, like, there are things about being on a Zoom meeting and interacting with people via video that is harder for your brain to process than if you were in a meeting with those real people and having a real conversation with them about the same stuff. Like, just basically it was a variance on the type of studying that I was good at and so this was very straining on me and you know I'm a little neurodivergent <laughs> my brain has a hard time but if I'm writing on a test or memorizing information like I can figure out how to study for a test and how to like visualize where things go um, I use like some sort of 2D spatial arrangement when I need to do a test, I guess, or learn something. But you couldn't do this. You had to like speak and tell and show on a real live person. And the only way I can describe it is that it like completely drained like my neurotransmitters dry. It was like a very concentrated experience to talk about that information in that way in real time for some reason when those words came out of my mouth I was like gutted of like that just took all of my precious resources <laughs> to be tested that way so that was just a weird thing that I went through during that time um I mean there were good things about it you got to get acupuncture and you we did qigong and it was a atmosphere of healthcare and a very um, supportive one so that was good and people were good but I was just worn down everybody's worn down and I thought what I was going through was just like everybody else we're all worn down but I think I know from the Lyme that I really it was amazing that I made it through basically Okay, so my last year of school, a few months before I graduated, um, I suddenly lost about 15 pounds. I was already at my low weight. That's like basically like a weight that I maintain. And then I lost another 15 pounds. I basically lost three 
sizes of clothes within that time. And I was concerned. First of all, I had this raging hunger. I could never be satisfied. I was always hungry. I was always obsessing about food. I would get so desperate for food. I would just like cry, just like feed me. Oh my God. And I never could be satisfied. So for breakfast, I would have three eggs, three pieces of bacon, two pieces of gluten-free toast with butter. My eggs were fried in lard. And then I would make a huge pile of kale because I need something else fibrous to fill my belly. And then within 90 minutes or two hours from that, I needed to repeat. I needed to have a huge bowl of food, a huge bowl of food, a huge, basically I ate uh, five meals a day plus snacks. And um, that's just what I needed to do. Sometimes I would have a whole can of coconut milk in one day. Uh, or like a whole packet of like meat or something. I would just like eat a whole roast, just pick it up and like shove it in my mouth. I was, I could not get enough. And so at one point I was like, this is ridiculous. I got to be eating 4,000 calories a day. Like what is going on? And I weighed out my food on a scale because I know portions are important. Um, we tend to under or overestimate portions. So I was like, I need to know how much butter is this? <laughs> and I wrote out everything and I analyzed my diet for two or three days. And no, I was not eating 4,000 calories, but I was eating 3,500 to 3,700 calories a day. And yet I was still, I had lost 15 pounds and I was still losing weight. So this really freaked me out. And it was strange because like, I've said this throughout my Lyme story, but it was like a part of me disappeared through this wasting away. It was like I was no longer inhabited in me. Maybe it was because I felt lighter. I'm trying to like logic this. I don't think there's any logic. Basically, I felt out of control and scared and I didn't know what was happening. So after like a while, after I figured out how much calories I really was eating, I was like, okay, this is severe. I have to do something. What I ended up doing was stopping all exercise at all. Um, so I stopped walking to school. I would only take the bus. I stopped going to a dance class. And this dance class was not intense. I was maybe burning 300 calories per dance class, like a two-hour dance class. It was not strenuous people. Like that does not account for 15 pounds lost, especially if I come home from dance class and eat like two sandwiches, okay, like this is not equating. I stopped going for hikes and like even like shopping, you know, or like going to the grocery store or going out somewhere. I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. So I stopped exercising because I really felt like my metabolism was going wild. And um, then I started to cocoon. Cocoon is a phrase I use when I go in bed and cover up my senses and just rest. And so I started to just rest because I really did feel totally exhausted. My energy level was probably like a two out of 10, but I was so pumped up on adrenaline. I was like running on fumes and I had to keep going because of grad school. So it was like, I didn't want to rest deeply because I was afraid I would never wake up to be able to graduate school. So I kind of compromised. I was like, okay, I'll rest for 10 minutes here, 20 minutes here. I'll put on a, listen to an audio book and listen to one chapter while I rest. And it took a few months, but, um, well, first of all, my weight started to maintain. So I was no longer losing any weight. And then over a few months, I gained a few pounds every month. And so I got back up to where I was. Um, so that was that. I also have to say, at this time, I got a new doctor. And I was tested for thyroid problems, which I did not have. You know, I know those tests can be a little wonky. But I think it, for hyperthyroid or Hashimoto's, I didn't have any wonkiness at all. Um, and I also was tested for parasites and I did not have those. 
So when I look at my graduation pictures, at this time, I had actually gained about 10 pounds from where I was in the early summer. But I still had, I don't know, I mean, maybe not. I had gained some weight. I had stopped losing weight probably in July, maybe June. So anyways, maybe I gained a tiny bit of weight. But I look at these pictures and I look more old, which is not a bad thing. We need to learn how to age a little bit better. I look older and more ragged and more tired when I was 31 graduating college than I do now at age 40 after having two kids and having been bedridden by Lyme and totally like disabled for two years and it was because I was just wasting away you know like I don't even have color in my skin it was crazy okay so one more thing I wanted to talk about was yes my dog caught Lyme and passed away and you know it's not related to my Lyme story in particular like I said but I want to bring it up because it did put Lyme on my radar just a little bit. I started to understand like how bad Lyme was. And I started to talk to other people, like some practitioners that I saw to help with my dog. And some of my professors would occasionally bring up Lyme. Um, so it got, I saw like the first layer of abs- absorbing information about the complexities of Lyme. So that was kind of, I don't want to say it pushed me towards realizing I had it, but it at least established how serious it is. And it made me become interested in learning more about it. Um, so when my husband and I went to Europe in 2010, um, my dog stayed at a friend's house in my hometown. And I'm sadly not surprised that she got Lyme. There's a lot of Lyme in Wisconsin. There's a lot of Lyme in my hometown area. Now you don't need to be in a Lyme endemic area to get Lyme. That's totally 100% sure. So this isn't to say that you need to live in an area with tons of Lyme to have it. We know that's not true. There can be Lyme carried from all sorts of different vectors. Doesn't always have to be ticks all the time or you know there's other ways that we get exposed and you know I met somebody from eastern Oregon that had Lyme when she was a kid and she became so 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 disabled from it and nobody knew it was Lyme because they had never had Lyme in eastern Oregon now I see ticks there all the time so I don't know if that's new because climate change or if it just wasn't part of popular opinion I'm not sure Um, anyways, my dog got Lyme and within a short time she became blind and had some major skin stuff and she started to kind of get mopey and looked kind of like creaky and in pain and she would have kind of feverish fits, I guess you could say. Um, and then in December she had a pretty bad experience with a feverish fit, I guess, and we took her into the vet and they, you know were like oh you know what you're from Wisconsin or like she stayed there before you came I bet she has Lyme and the vet said that she didn't think my dog was gonna make it through the weekend because she was pretty far gone so we did the, the vet also suggested like I don't think you have much time you could do testing you could do a treatment she's pretty far gone and Um, yeah, I I don't think you have much time. So just enjoy the time you have and make it really comfortable. And that's what we did. So we did not do a treatment. We did not do testing, but she got a Lyme diagnosis from clinical symptoms. Why can't people get that so quickly and easily? You know, how come no doctor was like, oh, you grew up in Wisconsin and you have these symptoms and it must be Lyme. For some reason, vets have the ability to do that and that kind of drives me crazy well about my dog she lived for another six months and I gave her herbs 
I gave her acupuncture. I took her to holistic vets. Um, I put her on this uh, raw dog food, which I had never done. And I mixed um, herbs in there for her. Um, she always had really bad skin. And the lime made her skin really, really bad. <clears throat> but it totally cleared up her skin while she was totally blind and very sick with Lyme. It was incredible, like, what food can do. And I thought that I fed her pretty well, but I think she really needed totally raw food. There's basically meat and vegetables, you know. Um, yeah, so she lived pretty well. I mean, she was mostly herself, you know, 75% of the time, and then 25% of the time she would kind of have, like, a feverish fit and then after one particularly bad feverish bit then she passed away so she was a lovely dog her name was Isis and she was half yellow lab and half greyhound and um yeah this is just when Lyme kind of entered into my life a little bit more but I was still so far from realizing that I myself had Lyme. So in the next video, I'm actually going to talk about how I got tested. All right. Thanks for listening. Wherever you are on your own healing journey, I send you luck. And uh, all right. Take care. Bye.